Hey, Michael Church, Crawl Space Ninjas. Today we have Andrew Davis with us again from Wilmington, North Carolina. And today we've got a special topic that, believe it or not, I am going to let him cover most of because he's been doing a lot of research and informing all of us about if you have water in your crawl space after a heavy rain, perhaps you're in a flood zone or in a low part where you're taking on your neighbor's water or like Andrew and those of them in Wilmington, North Carolina, you're at sea level. Stay tuned. If you're new to Crawl Space Ninja, we talk about everything related to waterproofing, humidity control, mold removal in your crawl space. We hope you'll subscribe to our channel, ring that notifications bell, and also follow us on Facebook. All right, Andrew, I'm going to give you the floor, man. You've been doing a lot of research, a lot of talking with Easy Flow engineers and NDS and all that. So uh, please let us know what you found out about flooding crawl spaces in low-level areas. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate the the opportunity to talk about it. I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. I'm excited to provide homeowners with solutions and Wilmington, North Carolina, and the surrounding region. So basically what led us down this path, Michael, we got involved with a homeowner who asked us to come out and do an estimate, just like any other homeowner. Came out to the house and realized that about 20 meters away from the back of the home, there was a significant water feature. And as a result, the obvious problem the homeowner had in the crawl space was water intrusion, right. both from a hydrostatic pressure of their home, which, which is fairly standard, but also because the groundwater was so close to the floor of their crawl space. So the home of note uh, was not in a flood zone. And so they were not paying flood insurance. The homeowner also happened to be a project manager with a local construction company, and she was pretty well versed in and the requirements for homes in flood zones and, and sort of what delineates a home needing flood insurance if it is inside of a FEMA flood zone. Of course, I got to preface this before I give the following story that any homeowner should check with their local insurance company to ensure that they're getting the best information as it applies to their home. But basically for the homeowner, she was told by her insurance company after receiving our estimate that if we did any kind of crawl space work, it would result in the level of her home home dropping to ground level and could result in a higher insurance premium because of the lower ground level of the home as a result of the crawl space work. So uh, did some independent research. In fact, I called her insurance agent and had a long conversation after doing some research into codes and some of the insurance underwriting. What I found out is that with her specific insurance company and two others in our area, we can do anything to a crawl space outside of a flood zone so long as we don't do a combination of two things. One, seal the vents, and I mean all the vents, and install a dehumidifier in an encapsulated space. Bottom line is that Crawl Space Ninja's system of leaving a vent unsealed and installing an, an active ventilation system does not cross the threshold and therefore does not create an environment that would drop the ground level to home, which is good news. In the process of that, I also reached out to our local NDS rep. Obviously, NDS is one of the most reputable piping and water management companies in, in the country. Once I got with the NDS, DS design team in an attempt to, should the insurance company come back and say, you can't encapsulate this space, there's nothing you can do that wouldn't violate the insurance terms and cause a homeowner to have a higher insurance. Our backup plan was to create a robust water management system that in fact has become sort of our go-to here for dealing with homes that are really close to a water feature, which is very common here along the coast. What that actually looks like after about three weeks of the NDS design team working with us is a grid system via the perimeter system that we currently use to deal with water in crawl spaces. What that grid system does is, is create a larger flow of water and catches more water as it creeps up vice the hydrostatic pressure coming from the outside, which the perimeter system would catch, the groundwater rising and the grid system catching that rising water pouring it into a sump pump or multiple sump pumps, and then obviously pumping all that water back out to the water feature. In the case of a hurricane or a major storm, there's nothing you can really do about flooding uh, except move the water out as quickly as possible as those floodwaters recede. But what I'm talking about is, is any time where the water level rises like this week currently in, in Wilmington, North Carolina and, and the surrounding uh, regions, uh, we're getting a, about two to three inches of rain. 
So NDS team did a great job designing the, the grid system for us. The actual products that they ended up throwing into the grid system don't differ too much from what Crawl Space Ninja currently uses in the perimeter system. It is easy flow. It is some T couplers that allow you to create the grid and then a larger catch basin out below the pop-up valve. We also, through the design team, recognized we need to take the water further away from the house. So to be specific, further away from the house is anywhere between 12 and 20 feet. And again, that larger catch basin underneath the pop-up valve allows the water to go somewhere other than under the house until that water can recede post-storm. And I hope okay. all that makes sense, Michael. Yeah, it does. I, I'm making some notes because there's some things that I wanted to, to talk about. And the last thing you mentioned was you need to make sure that you have a catch basin, which is basically a large basin. We call it a dry well. So that goes under the pop-up valve. Is that what you're saying? That's correct, Michael. Okay. So the other thing you mentioned is you want to get the catch basin and the pop-up valve as far away from the home as possible. Now, obviously, these homes that are built fairly close together, you can only take it as far as your property. So Very you don't want to be like crossing over into your neighbor and dumping all your water onto them, right? So just use common sense if you're hiring somebody to do something like that or you're planning on doing it yourself. Here, we, we take it to the street because we got storm drains and different things like that because it is groundwater, so you can direct it to a storm drain. Is that correct too? That's correct. The other thing, the grid system, System, I assume that's more of a customizable product where you all go in and you look at how the crawl space is laid out, how the footers are laid out. Here in Tennessee, we mainly do a full perimeter, but you're talking about a perimeter plus crisscrossing through the main parts of the crawl space. Is that also correct? That's correct. Picture a checkerboard and it can be formatted to fit between footers to any shape of any crawl space. Okay. And depending on the size of the crawl, depends on how many sump pump basins and sump pumps you would have in that situation. That's right, Michael. Does NDS have a formula for that? Or is that more of about the 140 linear feet that we go for? You think it's more than that or about the same? There's no change that we've seen with the 140 linear feet that we currently use. The other thing is you're saying water feature. In this instance, what is the water feature that you're dealing with? Is it a big pond or a lake or? In that particular instance of the home I was discussing, it was a stream that ran into the intercoastal waterway, which is, those viewers that don't know, along coastal North Carolina, there is a intercoastal waterway that separates an outlying island from the ocean and the inland part of the coast of North Carolina from the ocean as well. Creates okay. a barrier for storms and hurricanes alike. Okay. So if you're, say, in, a, in Florida on the coast, they would call it a canal or... or sure something like that. We've even had some mountain crawl spaces up high that was near maybe a, a big mountain lake. And of course, we say mountain, it's more like 6,000 square feet. It's not mountain compared to Colorado. Mountain, sure. But, but what you're saying is it doesn't matter. Anywhere your home is close to water, you're going to have more of a chance of a flooding issue, whether you're high up or low down. That's correct. Okay. The last thing, which is the one that, that uh, I want to delve into a little bit more because, you know, everybody always asks us, do we need to put a dehumidifier in the crawl space? And you're telling me that the dehumidifier in the crawl space voids the insurance level of ground. Is that correct? What did you call it? It creates a new ground level of the home. So part of the advantage of having a crawl space in a coastal region is that it elevates the home to a certain point, obviously, depending on the home. And the insurance uses that additional height to basically create a buffer between the groundwater and, and the subfloor of the home. What some insurance companies do is if you get crawl space work done, and this particular insurance company's policy was that if you sealed every single vent, encapsulated the space, so in other words, there's no airflow, and to put a dehumidifier in the space, the type of covered condition space that you created dropped the ground level of the home to the actual ground and therefore would result in them paying a higher insurance premium because their risk of flooding is greater. So basically, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is, is if you did all of that, the insurance company would look at that home as if it was built on slab. That's right. Okay. That's a, it's so, a great way to put it. So you took away, so if I had a four foot tall crawl space, obviously it would be difficult for floodwaters to reach that. But if you encapsulated that four foot tall crawl space, sealed all the vents, put in a dehumidifier, the insurance company considers that crawl space to be built on slab, which is why they charge you more money because they feel like you're more likely to flood. That's right. Okay. Now, for those of you that don't know, I have had a few homes uh, in Chattanooga 
that was in a floodplain. And if you're not dealing with floodplains, it's not a big deal. But what you don't want, and the reason why I see the insurance companies doing this, is if you sealed up all the vents and water hit that foundation wall, it could topple the wall over. That's right. Which is why you have to have a way for the water to get in and then get out. Uh, right. Other than a salt it's called a flood vent in many cases is what they'll call it, where some flood vents open automatically and all that. But as long as we have our active ventilation system in there, that is still okay. Even though there's a fan in there, the fan would obviously be ruined if it flooded, but that still counts towards the insurance company, not making it a slab height crawl space. Is that also correct? That's correct. Okay. So how do you address the humidity, Andrew? What do we do to address the humidity in a situation like that? If we cannot install a dehumidifier? I think, Michael, that ultimately we're able to still leave that single vent open and that active ventilation system still creates the negative airflow, which allows us to reduce the humidity, still requiring a dehumidifier in any circumstance there. It, would it be possible to uh, put the dehumidifier in the living space and duct it through the subfloor into the crawl space? Is that an option? That should not affect the insurance company in that way, correct? No, that, that could be an option. But again, you know, a lot of homeowners out there, they're not going to want you to cut into their flooring and all sure. that. But I assume there's no mechanical products allowed to be down there. Like their HVAC isn't allowed to be down there. Their water heater is not allowed. Is that also correct? Or can those be down there? So that's sort of the gray area, Michael. And the, and the irony in the situation is that a lot of the duct work to include HVAC systems and sewage systems and, and other lines are going into the crawl space. Hmm. So long as they don't touch the ground, the insurance company does not consider that an issue. Okay. So there could be a way to maybe even tap into that HVAC system with the DHU and blow dry air into the crawl space. And again, I'm not a big fan of returns and supplies in crawl spaces, but in this situation, that may be your only option. That's why we have these discussions is because everybody's house and every region in the country is going to be different. Sure. sure. Uh, What we see here is we see people adopt things in Knoxville that they maybe did in Chicago and they don't work or vice versa. Like I hate pumping water under the vapor barrier in a crawl space. So the condensation from the DHU, some of our competitors here, they'll actually drip that water under the plastic, which makes it a muddy mess. But in Minnesota or Wisconsin, you don't pump the water outside the foundation because you will you have to deal with freezing. So that's why we have these discussions. And I appreciate you bringing all this to our attention because uh, it, it may not be appropriate in Knoxville or in Nashville, but in Delaware, for example, right? And in, in uh, South Carolina, coastal regions, North Carolina, even Georgia's got some coastal regions that I'm sure would benefit from this information. So what What else do they need to know that would help them as far as this goes? Yeah, one more thing I want to highlight, Michael. So what we're seeing after rain in in this region is along the crawl space floor, standing water. And then that the standing water very quickly dissipates because the top layer of, of soil, a lot of times is sand underneath the house. Well, when you dig down, what we're finding is about a foot, maybe 18 inches down, is there's actually a thick layer of clay that retains the water. A couple of the homes that we've installed water management systems in, once you dig the trench for our piping or for the sump pump, is that there is a huge amount of standing water, even though that house might not be very close to groundwater the clay is retaining a ton of that water. And those houses have a noticeable difference. And and what I mean by that is quite a higher level of humidity found both in the masonry and softwoods of the crawl space. So their footer is probably in the clay, if I had to guess. And then the cinder block is is surrounded by sand. So as you start digging into that sand, just like on the beach, you instantly discover water. That's right. And I would just caution homeowners that are, are attempting to do this work themselves. If they do come across that water, it's important to determine whether that's groundwater or simply the water your crawl space is retaining in the clay and making that differentiation. Or sure. just call us and we'll come take a look at it for you. So are you burying your pipe all the way to the clay or are you still doing like we do where it touches the surface, the top of the pipe touches the surface? We bury it until it hits the clay uh, okay. so that it won't rise to the surface. We use river pebbles to uh, make sure there's a buffer there and then we bury it. What we're finding is there's only about mm, an inch to three inches of sand over top of it. Our concern initially was that that pipe would rise to the surface. And so far we haven't had an issue. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, the NDS Easy Flow is actually surrounded by styrofoam. So if you don't have it weighted, 
it can float out, especially if mm -hmm. it takes on water really fast. In your situation, since the sand is so porous and allows that water to infiltrate so quickly, you could go down to that clay bed that you're talking about and then cover it up three to four inches of sand. Exactly. That's right. Where if we did that, if we dug, you know, 12 inches deep and then covered up our pipe, we're covering it up with clay and clay restricts water movement. So that's why our pipe is closer to the surface because our main issue in a crawl space is always surface water for us. Sure. So that way, if we, it's kind of like a French drain. I'll put a link down below to this French drain problem a lot of people have is they'll actually bury the French drain too deep. And then that groundwater is hindered by the clay and never gets access to the French drain until a day or two later. So that's, that's why the different methodologies of Wilmington versus Knoxville, for example, that's, sure. that's great information, Andrew. The other thing I wanted to ask real quick that I just thought of is how do you address the vapor barrier? Do they allow you to overlap and tape and encapsulate, or does it have to be a loose lay vapor barrier in these flood uh, insurance situations? Again, ju just with the insurance companies that we have dealt with personally, the issue really lies in there being a opening for floodwaters to enter and exit the crawl space. So uh, encapsulation with a vapor barrier is fine, so long as there, an, as there is an entry and exit point for floodwaters, which would be that AVS event. The way we encapsulate here still applies there, basically, with the, Absolutely. attaching it to the foundation Absolutely. and all that yep. sort of thing. Yep, and actually Tennessee, North Carolina had the same termite gap and overlap requirements in their codes. Okay, I want to mention that real quick too, because that did come up in Nashville. We had a homeowner ask us for the code for the statewide termite gap. And just keep in mind that the, the termite gap is more of a local situation. So you would check with local codes in that instance, or I would recommend you check with local codes. And it also depends on your pest control company. I would also ask the pest control company what they want the termite gap to be because Cook Brothers, for example, here in Knoxville wants a four inch termite gap and all that's required is a three inch. So if we're doing a crawl space for a homeowner that has certain pest control companies, it's nice to know what that pest control requirement is so that it doesn't void the homeowner's warranty. So it's, it's nice to see that you've done that research there in Wilmington. Are you under more than one municipality there or is it pretty much just one? We're under more than one. There are no major code changes between the, the different counties and municipalities in which we work. All right, Andrew, that was some great stuff. By the way, if you all are watching this and you have any questions for Andrew, post them down below because uh, if you're living in a coastal area or near a pond or a stream or a, a lake, like, uh, you know, one of the first crawl spaces we did was in Denver, North Carolina, which there's huge lakes out there that we had to deal with as far as doing uh, water management and different things. So if you're near water features, we hope you'll give uh, Andrew a comment down below or ask a question. Anything else, Andrew, before I let you go? No, I, I'd love to be as much help as I can and uh, feel free to give us a call. And of course, I'll put a link to your uh, webpage down below so people can contact you directly if they need to. So Michael Church, Crawl Space Ninja with Andrew Davis out in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I hope I'll be out in Wilmington at some point because I hear it's beautiful out there. We hope you make it a happy, blessed day, and we'll see you later.